So uh, welcome to this uh, second section session in uh, in zooming in on the Gobi uh, on Tuesday, and um, we'll have six talks today. Um, and uh, I should just uh, start by telling the rules here. My name is Thais uh, Dahl. I'm an associate professor here, same uh, locality as Christian. Um, so he's my close colleague, and. Um, uh, the talk today will be 15 minutes and then five minutes for questions and please speak politely and use the chat politely so that uh, we don't have to lead, delete any of uh, the comments, but uh, use it frequently. And uh, if you have any technical difficulties, Christian is our IT guy here at University of Copenhagen, so he can solve any of those problems. So you're in good hands here. Uh, with that, I, I would uh, say the first speaker here uh, this afternoon or wherever you are, uh, late morning, um, is uh, just a second uh, by Kijang Li, and it's a presentation that is recorded on video, and um, the co collaborators are Oliver Lennant, uh, Ron Chang Wu, uh, Park Liang, Mao, and Na. And the title is the Palo cast in the Xia Qing Formation Late Ordovician, a record of the mid Cajun glaciation in South China. With that, I'll give. Here you go. Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here with you guys and I feel very happy to get a chance to dis discuss some science during this epidemic period. And today I'm going to talk something about pre Henanshan glaciation, as you can see from the title. And uh, let's start from a brief introduction about the background. After shifting into ice house condition in the middle Ordovician times, the late Ordovician is characterized by intensive glaciations of South Polar Gawana accompanied by major regressions exposing wide areas of low latitude Panion continents. Sedimentary record and oxygen isotope data from different Panion continents display multiple episodes of moderate glaciation and deglaciation during Cation. For example, in Sweden, Estonia and Latvia the exposure of carbon platforms lead to widespread and contemporarily paleocast in the middle occasion, indicating one of the most noble glaciation for the Hanansian. A few years ago, when I was still a PhD student in Germany, we briefly report a Cajun paleocast in South China. However, uh, we didn't pay too much attention until I came back to the Nanjing Institute. Then I start a new project about this topic. So today, I'm going to uh, show you guys some of our latest progress. Let's start from the geological settings. The South China block comprises three regions. The Yangs region, the Jiangnan transitional belt, and the Zhujiang region. They are distributed parallel in the northeast to southwest direction. The Palaeocast that I'm going to show you was found in the Xiazhen Formation at Zhujai section, where it's located in the northeast part of the Jiangnan slope. In this area, the so-called Zhegan platform. And uh, the age of the Xiazhen formation was assumed to the location. But uh, it's a lot more complicated, and I will talk about this later. The studies of Xiazhen formation can be traced back to 1980s. Based on paleontological and lithological data, Chen and his colleagues combined a cross-section of the Xiazhen Formation at Zhujai. 
which has been almost exclusively adopted by subsequent studies. Until a few years ago, the Xiazhen Formation had been remeasured by a group of Korean geologists. They divided the formation into four informal members. A lower limestone member, a lower shell member, a middle mixlithology member, and an upper shell member. And they also recognized repetitions in different outcrops at Zhujai, as you can see here. The paleoncast occurs in the top part of the mix, uh, uh, middle mix lithology member, where classified uh, limestones are kept by greenish to brownish shells of the upper shell member. Um, then here comes the results. And let's see what we got from here. There is the shallowing upward sequence in the top part of the middle mixer lithology member. The erosion surface is cutting down from the top of C11 into the upper C8, at least 7.5 meters thick. And here is the piece of sample from uh, C10 which displays the details of the clastic view with corroded corals and reworked uh, classes. Then we have a flooding surface indicating a deepening and a transgression after the erosion. In the thin sections, we found altered limestones which are characterized by blended or loof-shaped uh, pseudo spa crystals and microspars in many cases. And some of the fossils such as corals and algae are fully dissolved. Fossils and classes are usually iron stain, bored and partly silicified, which also suggests a significant exposure. Here is another good example. We can see those uh, ubiquitous pseudospar crystals and microspars. They indicate that uh, the sediment underwent early flushing by meteoric fluids as a result of large-scale eustatic sea level drop. Okay, uh, enough thin sections. I don't want you to get bored with the microfacials. But anyway, we saw nice uh, sedimentological records, suggesting that we might have a gap here. Then how about the stratigraphy? Actually, we collected both uh, conodon and isotope samples at this section. Everybody told us that um, it's very difficult to get any, uh, to find any uh, conodons in the Xiazhen formation. So we hire some local villagers and got huge block of limestones. And it took us uh, over a year to finish all this uh, all the job in the, in the lab. Very lucky. We do confirm the Yaoxian Anzis zone at the top of the middle mix uh, lithology member. Published graptolite data uh, show a Campanatus zone suggesting a location age of the upper shell member overlaying the paleocast surface. So we do have a gap. And a time of uh, sub-aerial exposure falls into the mutation. Uh, and our high resolution carbon isotope data do not only document the crop and farewell excursions in the middle mix lithology member but also show an overlap between the two different outcrops at Zhudai, as suggested by the Korean geologist. Based on those results that we just showed, 
if we do a little uh, stratigraphic uh, correlation, then we are, uh, then we will find we are here. It turns out that uh, most of the Xiazhen formation should be correlated to the middle to early uh, Cation rather than the late Cation as previously assumed. It means that um, we got a middle Cation cast in, a, in this formation. But why? Why we got exposure during this period? As we mentioned at the beginning, oxygen isotope indicates the uh, development of substantial pre hernation ice sheets during the middle to late Cation, suggest multiple episodes of moderate glaciation and deglaciation before the hernation. In the middle Cation, a pronounced global cooling is reflected by major regression on Bodica and Laurentia. The huge gap in the Xiazhen formation at Zhujai that we just shown is presumably related to this strong climate shifts. Of course, regional factors might also play a role. As some of you might know, the late Ordovician was a quite dynamic period in South China, and intracontinental originally took place in South China from the uh, late Ordovician to the early Silurian, leading a northwest war expansion of the Carpathian land. Uh, since the Cation, this expansion has caused a significant uplift of the former slope areas and lead to the development of the Zhegan platform. Where the Zhujai section is located. So the regional tectonic event might also promote the transcend exposure of the carbonate platforms during the mid -cation. And uh, we are going to remeasure the Xiazhen formation at the type section and also um, try to explore other sections nearby in order to further confirm uh, what we found in, at Zhujai, which might also help to answer how the regional tectonic event affect the exposure during this time. And finally, some conclusions. Based on the sedimentological evidence and uh, new conodon collections, a mid Cation paleocast is confirmed at Zhujai. High resolution carbon isotope data document the Cope and Fairwheel excursions in the middle mixtilithology member of the Xiazhen formation. This chemostratigraphic data also confirm an overlap of strata between the two different outcrops in the study section. The gap in the Xiazhen formation is presumably related to the mid Cation glaciation when the corresponding dramatic globally recognized eustatic sea level 4 affected and widely castified tropical and subtropical carbon platform, uh, such as uh, in Bottica and Laurentia. So, this is the end of my talk. And thank you for your attention and welcome for the questions. Thank you. Um, do anyone have a question? I, I have one question. Yep, no, sorry, you will add. Sorry. Who who is talking? Uh, Christian can go ahead. I can go later. Okay. I, okay, so I was uh, just one. Um, that the sound is a bit weird now. Okay. I was just wondering, wondering how big the. Um, I think do you on it. Do you have a speaker on it? Just a second here. Yeah.
yeah, it's just because there was a lot of noise when I was talking. Uh, so, okay, I was just wondering how big this uh, sea level fall might have been. Uh, do you know that, uh, Kijan or maybe Oli? Uh, you mean you mean uh, how long the gap, right? I, I was actually thinking uh, uh, how many meters. Do you have any ideas how how big the sea level drop actually was? Uh, is it fifty meters or something like that? Uh, actually, I'm I'm not so sure. <laughs> we just uh, know that uh, we have uh, like more or less like uh, less than ten meters the uh, paleoclast erosion surface, and um, uh, based on the conodons and grab slide data, we uh, we we assume that uh, we we just uh, miss uh, miss the time like uh, the whole the whole KA three or part of the KA three something like this. But uh, uh, I'm not so sure <laughs> with with uh, uh, this. Uh, how how deep is uh, we? I mean, the the sea level drop is maybe uh, Oliver have a better idea with this. Yeah, well, um, Christian, um, the the problem is um, that uh, on Baltica, of course, we know the surface flooded uh, by <clears throat> all these uh, Fieca shale deposits, and um, so it's in the range of, of 25 meters where we have this morphology, which doesn't mean anything, you know, how much of a sea level drop we have. And if you go to Laurentia, uh, it's in the range of maybe a couple of tens of meters. But I think it, it will be very difficult to make a clear statement, um, you know, how many meters, me uh, we we have no no real indications, uh, so we we also have you know multiple uh, erosional surfaces in the Katia and, and also in the Hinensian, and uh, so in in some of those areas I think it's very very difficult to find uh, any fossil evidence or anything which would uh, show us how many meters of sea level fall we really could calculate. It was easier in the Hinansen, of course, but uh, maybe that, uh, and I, I don't remember the death of paleo valleys uh, in Northern Africa or other places, but uh, it's for sure in, in the range of uh, several tens of meters. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you. I think we'll move on to the next speaker, and that is Susanne Arns and myself. Um, Susanne will give the talk uh, entitled No Consensus on Timing and Cause of Paleozoic Oxygen Rise, a Case for the Significance of Respiration. Um, Hi, Thais. Hey, thank Susanne. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to start up my PowerPoint. Uh, let's see. Uh, how that works. So I hope you can see this. Is that complete now on your screen? Yes, it is. Good. All right. Um, yeah, so I work with Thais in, uh, in Copenhagen at the Globe Institute. I'm a postdoc. And uh, I'm working on theories for oxygen increases uh, during the Paleozoic. So uh, as the Paleozoic includes the Ordovician, uh, it also has uh, in, 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 um, relevance for, for Gobi. Uh, though a lot of it might have happened later, actually. Um, so in general, what causes oxygen to build up in the atmosphere? Well, basically, there is um, um, small offset in the balance between uh, photosynthesis and respiration. And uh, this, uh, um, this leads to a little pool of refractory, refractory organic carbon that builds up over time and is sedimented and buried in oceans, but also on land. And um, well, then of course, some of this is also oxidized again. Uh, so on geological timescales, there should be like a balance between the sedimentation and burial and uh, the oxidative weathering rate. Um, and this is basically represented by this uh, equation over here. Now, what do we know about oxygen levels in the Phaneozoic? Well, uh, there have been two models uh, I would uh, note here. Um, 
GeoCapsule, this is a benchmark model for uh, modeling oxygen based on uh, isotopic data. Um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, by Bob Werner, and he's done a lot of work before he published this in 2006. Uh, it's, if you look at the curve here, so you have the age here and the oxygen level, uh, Bob Berners curve is this one, and it's basically saying that oxygen levels were high throughout the Phenozoic. Um, and what's really uh, controlling the level is, uh, is some sort of tectonic recycling, so it's basically carbon cycle driven. Um, yeah, and then, uh, well, basically the fraction, so it's driven by um, carbon-13 uh, isotopes um, of carbonates, um, and these are sensitive to oxygen level. Um, and then also you have this rapid recycling. So he, he was struggling a lot uh, in the early works to keep, uh, to keep oxygen levels in, in within reasonable ranges and ended up uh, adding this uh, sensitivity. What's worth noting here is that oxidative weathering is not oxygen dependent in the geocarb solve model. Um, and I mean, and that any oxygen increase can only be temporary. Um, so then there is the COPSI model, uh, first from 2004 and then in a revised version in 2017. And you can see those curves for oxygen here from COPSI. Uh, those both start out with the uh, low oxygen level uh, back in the early um, Paleozoic. Um, in that model, it's uh, it, well, it's basically um, internal feedbacks that's controlling where the oxygen ends up at. So you will have an increased organic uh, carbon burial, more or less prescribed by increased uh, vegetation productivity and also um, evolution of uh, carbon to phosphorus fractions. Um, and that leads to a permanent increase in oxygen. Uh, now, in order for this not to run out of hand, there needs to be a controlling feedback. So in that model, oxidative weathering is uh, oxygen dependent and will give you a, a balance. So as you can imagine, uh, the two models actually work quite differently when, it's, when we're talking about oxygen control. Now, the question here is then, is oxidative weathering oxygen dependent? And also, uh, could plants have had an effect on this? Now, uh, Lee Compley first suggested that uh, respiration on the land surface could have an influence on uh, oxidative weathering uh, for the new Proterozoic. So he, uh, together with Kansaki and Kumbo, so in 2017, uh, published a model where they looked at pyrite weathering rates and how these are affected by respiration in soil. Um, but and when you're looking at the Paleozoic, it's actually not the pyrite weathering that's important because uh, pyrite is already depleted. You don't see any detrital um, pyrite. So uh, we have to look again at this refractory organic carbon and how that responds to oxygen. So uh, here is another model from 2017. Um, and that was uh, Dane. So that's basically co-workers of, uh, of the COPSI people. So coming out of the same group, um, they're looking at how oxidative uh, weathering of refractory organic carbon is sensitive to, to oxygen. So they basically used a reactive transport model and tested that for a lot of different oxygen levels uh, and uplift rates and to see what the sensitivity is on a global scale. They scaled up by some area scale up and uplift in that. All right, um, and what they see is actually that we have a, a, a O2 sensitivity for oxygen levels that are reasonable to assume for the Phenozoic and Paleozoic. Whereas uh, sedimentary pyrite, that's already depleted before. So this is uh, in tune with what we were expecting. Um, well, and then you can ask yourself, okay, what is the evidence for that we actually have an O2 dependence or an indication of that that could be one? Well, do we see refractory organic carbon uh, surviving in the surface system, like being uh, eroded and deposited again? And yes, we do see that actually. Um, we do find that there is uh, carbon-14 neutral uh, carbon being deposited uh, in marine settings. So there is an indication that some of this refractory organic carbon is surviving a trip to the Earth's uh, surface. Um, all right. Now, we wanted to look at the respiration. So we're trying to uh, implement a respiration model into this reactive transport model that's been used before. 
And basically, the model is a dual Arrhenius Michaelis Menson kinetic model. So it both depends on the carbon content and the oxygen content in the soil. Now, it, this is not the same carbon as the refractory organic carbon. Now we're talking about fresh label, label organic carbon. Um, and then uh, the porosity of the soil is also important and the water saturation index. And that's basically because uh, the respiration rate uh, depends on how much water is in the soil. If you have a, a low water content, then actually not a lot of carbon will be respired because it needs to be wetted and dissolved. Um, whereas uh, if you have very high water saturation index, then the respiration becomes oxygen limited because there's not a lot of diffusion into the soil when, when the pores are filled with water. So there's um, an intermediate stage where, where you have um, the most respiration. So these are some of the things to consider when you're applying a respiration model. Um, yeah. So this is what we did. We put a respiration model on top of a reactive transport model. So what you can see here is uh, basically the profiles of oxygen, which is the blue and refractory organic carbon for two different scenarios. So we have uplift rate. Um, so that's basically a transport of refractory organic carbon up through the soil and then oxygen diffusion going in. These two different scenarios, well, one kind of represents a bryophyte matte world Ordovician like land surface. Um, and over here, we've introduced uh, roots or, of respiring soils down to a me one meter step. Now, what you can see over here is that uh, the, so this is sort of a depletion front. So almost all of the refractory organic carbon is depleted when it reaches the surface, it's been oxidized. Whereas if you have a uh, respiration, well, then the oxygen profile is controlled a lot by the respiration here. So the oxidative weathering primarily uh, is happening up here in the top and uh, it's a lot less. So if you integrate over the profile, you can see that oxidative weathering rate is much smaller here in the rooted world than in the matte world. Now, if you think about that, that should actually lead to an O2 oxygen increase over time. Uh, because there's less oxidative weathering than before, so not as much of the refractory organic carbon from this big pool is being uh, broken down. So oxygen is increasing. And while as oxygen increases, more oxygen goes into the soil and, uh, and this profile starts moving downwards. So it looks more like this. And that's a lot like the profile from before. But the big difference is that the oxygen level over here is much higher than it was over there. Now we can try and make a sort of a sensitivity analysis for, uh, for oxidative weathering uh, for different uh, respiration depths um, at different oxygen levels. So that's basically what we see here. We see that in a matte well, which is the solid line here, at quite low oxygen levels, uh, uh, Refractory organic carbon is depleted. There is no increase in oxidative weathering with oxygen. But then if we put in the roots, then you see how this profile is shifting right. So the more, uh, the, the deeper the respiring layer, uh, the higher the oxygen level needs to be to reach the same oxidative weathering rate as it had in the matte world. Now we can do this for different uplift rates um, to see how, uh, uplift rate could have an influence on this. And uh, so this is basically the same as before with just the matte world and a two meter respiring soil for different uplift rates. And to see what the shifts would be like, well, we have to put in a starting point. So what do we assume the oxygen level was in the beginning? Uh, something like 0.23 is common in the COPSI model to assume for the Ordovician. Um, and what you can see here is for each of these, uh, there, there, there should be a shift corresponding to the red arrows here up to a higher oxygen level. And uh, what you actually see is that there is an optimum or a maximum here at intermediate uplift rates. And these actually kind of correspond to the average mean of the surface today, randomly. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, why is this? Uh, well, I mean, if you look at the curve, the optimum is where you have actually depleted uh, oxidative weathering, uh, but then you uh, you can still you still have to move quite quite a far up to deplete it again if you introduce roots. So up here, for instance, you're far from 
from depleting it. So even though you have higher optive rates, it's, it's not going to give a, a higher imprint. And down here, you're simply limited by the low optive rates. Now, how long does it take to reach these oxygen levels? Uh, it's not really possible at this point in our work to make a global model and scale it up because in order to do that, you need to know, uh, you actually need to make some, some global simulations of productivities and soil depths to get like a geographical uh, variation of this. So what we did instead to see how quickly the response would be is that we took like a, just a one meter soil and then looked at how much would that change the oxygen above it. So we are calculating the offset in, in uh, uh, oxidative weathering uh, from, from the get-go, from the start and integrating up over time. So basically that's kind of assuming that there's going as much in oxygen into the atmosphere as there was uh, oxidative weathering in the start. Now, what you can see here is if we start out again at 0.23, then uh, oxidative weathering uh, is, uh, is decreased enough to bring oxygen levels up to about one, uh, about what we have today for, for two meters. You also see that when you get up to two meters or higher, the, the extra effect is not so large. And if you look at this for different uplift rates, um, well, so this is basically time slices. So the yellow points here is after 10,000 years, after 1 million years, and after 10 million years. And you can see how, again, you get this optimum at, uh, at uh, mean uh, er erosion rates or uplift rates. Um, and that in any case, the oxygen level is increasing for all, even down here, but that's another story. Uh, so there is some, something going on here really pushing up oxygen levels when you introduce uh, respiration. Now, to conclude on this, um, so we're suggesting that there is another mechanism that we need to consider, and that is that rooted plants uh, affected the, or the advent of the different evolutionary stages affected the oxidative weathering sink. And that this could actually have led to a really large increase in oxygen levels just by affecting the oxygen sink. Now, um, it can happen quite fast. We get a small indication of that for, from the time evolved model, um, how fast it can happen. It seems like uh, what could be limiting here is more the evolutionary stage than, than how fast the process is. Um, so what's worth noting here is that there is these geographical shifts. So we don't necessarily expect uh, oxidative weathering to be controlled by the same area as it was before. Um, yeah, and in contrast to previous model, uh, models, uh, both COPSI and GeoCARB, we don't assume that oxidative weathering is a constant function of oxygen in time. This must have changed over time as, as uh, the vegetation and the land surface evolved. And I also want to stress that this is a mechanism is not ruling out any previous work. I mean, it's a mechanism that would work together with increases by increased organic carbon burial. I mean, think about if you have increased organic carbon burial and then you have a reduction in the sink at the same time, then you can really have uh, large increases, uh, certainly certain shifts. Yes, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Susanna. Um, do we have any questions for Susanna? Well, I could ask one question. Yeah, question. So you mentioned your vision a few times here, but how likely is it that something like this will happen during the Gobi or, or just after? I, I, I mean, I recall Ty is giving a presentation where he said it's basically around this time we see something, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, I mean, it's, it's really depending on what's going on at the land surface at this point in time. The, I mean, it's, it's difficult to say exactly which evolutionary steps would have caused the largest effect here. It could have been an early one or a later one. It really, I think, also depends on, on, on the geographical settings. And I mean, if you think about it, if there's not much oxygen available in, in these low regions, uh, low-lying regions where you have the first land plants, and then you 
taken away by respiration, then the oxidative weathering rate is becoming even more limited. So there could be an effect there. I must say though, in, in the model, as simple as it is right now, the largest effects are when you, when you get roots that are one, two meters deep. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, are there any other questions for Susanne? Well. Yeah, Oli? Yeah, uh, I'm just wondering um, how much of an effect you have uh, during the collision of Laurentia and Baltica, you know, creating a Himalayan type origin. Um, is there any possibility to, uh, to model that or to calculate what kind of effect this uh, huge origin might have been with respect to weathering rates? Yes, of course. I mean, you, you have a different geographical setting and you have different uplift rates. And in principle, uh, higher uplift rates can give a lot of oxidative weathering. Um, so, I mean, but yeah, that right now the limitation is that we need to have some sort of globally uh, uh, geographical model that shows geographical variability. And that has not been done for oxidative weathering models at all. Yeah, I mean, uh, with respect to the Gobi, the collision might fit in. And uh, uh, if you think about that, it might have been an origin of about uh, 10 to 12 kilometers in, in high, uh, how it's at least proposed by uh, different geologists uh, that would, uh, you know, have a major impact to this kind of uh, modeling, I think. Yes. Definitely. I mean, it's always taking place in a geological setting and how large the impact is, is uh, really depending on all those factors. I mean, you can see how, how, how large the sensitivity is to different uplift rates. So if you introduce very high uplift rates, yeah. then you will definitely see some effect on oxidative weathering. So, yeah, I mean... You could take a look at the Danes paper to see how they reached a global uh, sensitivity mm -hmm. function for that and see that it's actually right now it's uh, limited to a current day uh, uplift rates or erosion rates. And, yeah. Yeah, so it, it should be done for the Caledonian origin uh, in a way to understand uh, the evolution during the middle late order vision when we have this collision. And uh, I mean, the, the uplift rate should be uh, tremendously high in this case. Mm -hmm. okay, thanks. It's really hard to say whether this uh, extra erosion is leading to extra carbon burial or extra mm. oxidative weathering, which of these two is winning out. I mean, we need more models to, to get an idea of this. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Susanna. I think we'll move on to the next speaker. All right. And that is Alvaro Del Rey, Michael Kellner, Christian uh, Magum Rasmussen, and myself. Um, the talk is entitled Understanding the Relationship Between Global Oxygenation State of the Oceans and the Great Ordovician Biodiversification Event. Alvaro, you're here. Yes, uh, hello everyone. Uh, can you hear me? I, I think Susanna should uh, stop sharing her screen first, right? Oh yes, that's good, because otherwise you're just looking at a pretty picture, right? Yes. <laughs> How do I do that? Oh yeah, there it is. Sorry. Just a sec. Right, can you all see it? Yes, we can. All right, so, um, well, hello everybody. Uh, I'm Alvaro, I'm Thais' a PhD student. And today I'm gonna to talk about the study uh, titled Understanding the Relationship Between the Global Oxygenation State of the Oceans and the Great Autovision Biodiversification Event. 
As we all have seen already so far in the conference, we know that during the, the middle of the vision basically witnessed the most rapid and sustained increase in marine family and genus level diversity in entire Earth history, also called uh, the Great Ordovician Biodiversification Event or uh, GOBI. And with such an event, the question is rather simple. What caused this very dramatic increase in diversity? And although this is also a very straightforward question, it is fundamental in the understanding of the relationship between life and the environment. How does life relate to the environment? What causes life to suddenly change so much that the face of Earth was never the same anymore? Uh, the marine ecosystem were completely changed uh, from microbial dominated reefs to metazoan dominated reefs. Basically, what happened in the ocean was never the same anymore. So there are some uh, hypotheses that are trying to explain this or give an explanation of why this happened when it happened. One of them being cooling, that basically indicates that very uh, hot conditions during the Cambrian and early Ordovician changed to uh, the sea surface temperatures to modern equatorial uh, range that basically uh, having more favorable to conditions allowed life to thrive. And we also have uh, another hypothesis that is more fundamental that basically relates the amount of atmospheric oxygen with this increase in life. Why? Because uh, metazoan life requires oxygen to survive and therefore having more oxygen would have allowed more or would have sustained more uh, life. And basically it's been shown that a plot of increasing atmospheric oxygen follows this diversification trend. So looking at the greater picture, basically we have that basically these two factors, the cooling and the increased atmospheric oxygen. In uh, also um, among others, such as the particular tectonic configuration taking place during the middle of the vision uh, com in comparison to what happened in the Cambrian and earlier division, basically we have, may have triggered or facilitated the onset of the Gobi. So uh, in this study, we basically take one of these uh, hypotheses, uh, we assess basically the relationship between oxygen and the COVID by analyzing uranium isotopes in marine carbonates. For the ones that are not familiar with uranium isotopes, we can actually have an assessment of oxygenation or rather the global oxygenation uh, uh, state of the ocean by analyzing uranium isotopes because uranium is a redox sensitive element. Uranium-6 is soluble, uranium-4 is insoluble Uranium reduction involves large isotope fractionation. Uh, the heavy uranium gets favor into the reduced state or insoluble uranium-4. And uranium has a conservative behavior in the oceans, which means the uranium has a globally uniform and well mixed isotopic distribution in the oceans. So basically what we have here is then when uh, there are more uh, anoxic water masses or enhanced marine anoxia, more reducing conditions are going to be in the oceans and therefore more of the heavy uranium will be taken out of solution into the reduced states, leaving behind uh, depleted waters in the heavy isotope or enriched in the lighter one, which is translated into lighter or more negative uh, uranium isotope values. On the contrary, when we have less anoxic water masses or a more oxygenating state of the oceans, we have less of the heavy uranium being taken out of solution and therefore waters are not depleted into the heavy uranium or rather are enriched in the heavy uranium and therefore the isotopic signatures move towards more positive or higher values. So that's basically the understanding of uranium isotopes. Now, why marine carbonates? Well, basically because the incorporation of uranium as a trace element into marine carbonates such as calcitic skeletons involves limited isotope uh, fractionation. Therefore, when we are determining the uranium isotope composition of marine carbonates, in principle, we are um, under, um, 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 determining the uranium isotope signature of seawater at time of deposition um, uh, and type of deposition. And although this is in principle, so therefore when we measure the uranium isotope composition of marine carbonates, we can actually see the uranium isotope composition of seawater at time of deposition. And although some processes taking place post-depositional or during the genesis can and most likely will alter the isotopic signature of uh, the, the carbonates, we can actually, that's, we can actually assess the, um, the originated state of the ocean by analyzing carbonates and what happens during the agenesis is something that we can take care of uh, separate. 
So which carbon sequences are we going to analyze? Well, basically, Kinequilla in Sweden, that represents the positional conditions of the Bad Toscandian Paleo Basin. Here we can see the continental reconstruction of the middle of division of around 467 million years ago. We can see the Paleo continent of Baltica and the red squares represent Kinequile. And here we also, we can see the profile of Kinequile with the different formations. But in this study, we are only focusing in the Lana and Hodin limestones and the Gulhogen formation. So going uh, directly into our results, we can actually see here, this is the Kinecole drill core with the different limestones, Lana, Holland, and the Gulhagen formation. And we can see here our uranium isotope values uh, in association with the carbon isotope values as well. Very briefly, again, uh, when our uranium isotope values go towards more positive values or higher, we can actually interpret it as more oxygenated uh, oceans. And when these values go towards more negative, we can actually say that there are more anoxic water masses or less oxygenated state of the global oceans. To see whether or not our isotopic values could be related to post-depositional processes during diagenesis, as I mentioned before, we basically created these cross plots related uranium isotopes and several elemental ratios that could be related to mineralogic to changes occurring post-depositional or during diagenesis. For example, dolomitization being expressed as magnesium calcium ratios or different proportions between aragonite and calcite being represented as strontium calcium. And also, for example, the presence of diagenetic fluids high manganese and lower in strontium uh, being represented by manganese and strontium ratios. And what we see here in very general terms is that we don't see any correlation between our uranium isotope values and these different um, elemental ratios. And therefore we can see that we can say that at least our uranium isotope values are not related to those specific uh, processes taking place during diagenesis uh, in, in very rough terms. So, uh, very generally speaking, when we look at the behavior of uranium values, we can actually see two important uh, changes. First of all, we see a relatively stable uranium values or uh, global redox conditions for the late Dapingian and uh, early Dari William, or late Dapingian three and late, uh, until the late Dari William one. And then we see a more clearly fluctuating uranium isotope values from middle to late Dari William, or Dari William two and Dari William three. That these are also associated with the period of time where the carbon isotopes are, uh, have the largest uh, variation. When we start looking at the diversity data, and here we plot the typical diversity curve of number of genera, that increases over time, we cannot really see a very obvious relationship between all uranium values and basically the diversity uh, curve. However, when we look at more specific, in this case, the relative diversification rates, we see something that is a lot more interesting. First, we see that this is the period of a stable uh, values, uranium isotope values or uh, oxygenation state of the ocean or redox landscape of the ocean is related to the period where the time interval leading to the greatest uh, relative diversification rate or the main peak the, uh, of the Gobi. And after this period, the, uh, when uranium isotope values start fluctuating uh, more clearly, these are related to the MDICE, uh, positive carbon excursion, which is coherent with uh, this being produced by enhanced organic carbon burial. Uh, so, uranium stove values mirrors this positive carbon excursion. And this is related to the period where the relative diversification rates starts decreasing. Of course, originations are still higher and greater than extinctions and therefore the diversity group, uh, curve keeps increasing. But in general terms, uh, the relative diversification rates decrease when we see these highly fluctuating uranium isotopes. And when we see it more stable, we see the opposite the relative diversification rates increasing. Then when we look at even more detail of the uh, diversity curves, we can actually see that, of course, during this period of more stable uranium isotope values, we have the greatest increase in origination rates, of course, but we also see an increase in genus age and life expectancies uh, coming from uh, the Dapingian. And then, once again, when we look at what happened after this, we see that these fluctuations in uranium isotopes are related to a decrease in oxygenation rates, 
origination rates and the relative diversification rates in general. And this goes basically against to what was expected in the hypothesis relating oxygen and an increase in diversity or evolution, meaning that here an increase in originations is not related or we cannot really see an increase in uh, marine or global oxygenation. On the contrary, we see a relatively stable riddle landscape when the most originations took place during the Darry William one. Then if we look at then when we look at the um, another the other this um, a hypothesis, which is basically the temperature, we can actually see that the modern equatorial uh, sea surface temperature range was reached also at the beginning of the Darwinian or during the Darwinian one. Uh, therefore, now with this, we can actually maybe start thinking that temperatures or the cooling had a greater effect or had a greater impact into this uh, diversity or the origination of the, of the COVID. However, when we look at, again, the broader picture, we can actually see that this modern equatorial sea surface temperature range got, uh, got, was reached during the Darwin William, but stayed through the Sambian and the Katian. But when we look at the diversity curve, we can see that the time interval where originations were the greatest or the relative diversification rates is uh, occur in a narrower time interval, which is basically uh, the Darwin William one. So the relationship then is not as clear as uh, we could actually see or we could actually uh, thought. So, uh, but I want you to, 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 the message that I want to convey here is just basically that at the beginning we see a stable riddles landscape of the ocean that is related to this main peak of the Gobi and at the same time these favorable conditions expressing temperature uh, were reached. However, then these favorable conditions after that continue, yet originations start decreasing. And this is related to this highly fluctuating riddle landscape on the oceans. So here the relationship that I want to, that I want you to actually observe, although it may be very simple, but it's, um, but it's just basically trying to see an, a sense of stability of the environment when diversification occurs. So my message is basically that a relatively stable global oxygenation state of the oceans or the landscape prevail in this interval leading to the main peak of the COVID. And then a fluctuating or unstable global oxygenation state of the oceans in association with a disturbed carbon cycle, uh, the MDIs, was related uh, to a decrease in relative diversification rates or originations. And with this, uh, my main message here, it can be a little bit stating the obvious, but with this, we can see that it doesn't, it's not just having favorable conditions to life in principle, such as the cooling. A relatively stable environment may also be necessary to facilitate this main peak of the Gobi, as we can see here. Uh, so basically, my idea is uh, trying to have this assessment of what is a stable environment and uh, something that we can actually see with these Uranus values. And finally, because I've seen it in the, also yesterday, uh, was a little bit discussed, we can actually see that this limestone um, level called the Talistan occurs basically after or marks a difference or the change into this more stable region landscape of the oceans and then this more fluctuating one. I don't really know what could be the case, but for me, I just want to put it there to highlight that this may represent a change in the Earth's system, once again, from this uh, more stable riddles landscape that allowing and favorable conditions allowing, uh, or related at least, to the main peak of the Gobi, then changing to a uh, Earth system where more fluctuating riddles landscape associated with a fluctuating uh, global carbon cycle is related to a main peak of the, uh, to a decrease in relative diversification rates although there were already established favorable conditions in uh, the temperatures of the oceans. So yeah, that's my presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Alvaro. Do we have any questions for, for Alvaro? Nope. 
Yeah, I've got one. Oh, you got one? <laughs> yeah. Okay, Joe. Cool. Thanks, Laura. Um, I was just wondering how well mixed uranium is across the global oceans and the residence time, because, um, of course, we see different um, diversification patterns and timing in different continental blocks. And do we have any data for whether the uranium patterns were correlated with locally or whether you're seeing a global signal? Which is correlated with maybe local data. Well, in principle, because of the residence uh, time of uranium, they should be well mixed compared to the ocean uh, typical mixing. But then again, I mean, we have only one section. Uh, maybe we see more than one section. We can actually assess whether the signal that we see can be global or local, because we know in the latest uh, studies of uranium isotope, we know that local effects may have an important role. So that's why here, uh, instead of, for me, I mean, because that's the, I mean, I've, what we know so far with uranium isotopes is that some things happen during the genesis, but it's very difficult to pinpoint and to say, okay, it is because of this process or this other process. So we never, it's been systematically shown that we are, there are not really correlations with uranium and none of the typical diagenetic proxies. So something is going on. And, I've, and I understand that question that, yeah, it could be very questionable, maybe uh, if you're looking at local or global, but, um, but yeah, I think like with more sections, we can actually assess that. So far, we cannot really do it other than just basically see more general patterns and not interpreting these particular values as an original seawater signal. So, I, I, so right. for me, it's, a general fluctuation and to see how the middle landscape of the ocean rather than to believe that this is our original seawater signal. Sure. Thanks. Thanks. Richard Hoffman has a, has a question for you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I was wondering uh, whether or not the bioturbation scenario, you know that uh, during the order with the lower order vision and especially during the middle order vision, you have an increase of the mixing depth of the sediment and this would be a sink for uranium. So um, are there any ideas how to take this into account or does this hypoth hypoth and, and hypothesis uh, play into the signal? Uh, I think that's, that's a great question because I think that that's part of where now the knowledge of uranium isotope needs to be improved, basically. I think like that's sort of uh, where we now are and um, we need to start assessing how these local processes could be having an effect on uranium isotope. It's been shown that local conditions can have an effect on uranium isotope. And then again, uh, unfortunately, we cannot really point, pinpoint how specifically bioturbation may have changed the, uh, the overall isotopic signature of marine carbonate. So I cannot really tell you um, uh, what, what would be the effect? Because I think like we can we cannot agree for the people working in isotopes that that's where that's where we are now in the current knowledge of isotope marine carbonates. There is there is this need of trying to assess which specific environmental uh, aspect are having an, an effect on the signatures of marine carbonates. So what we can see here, or with this type of data, we can actually see more general fluctuations. And in order to assess whether or not these values could be more related or more representative of original seawater signal, which, uh, so taking into consideration any uh, process taking place during the genesis, such as uh, bioturbation, is by uh, subtracting to these values a correction factor based on what it has been seen in modern Bahamas. So that's what we know so far about how to assess these processes and uranium isotopes. We need more studies for sure. I'm afraid we have to move on. Um, so if you stop sharing, I will, I will introduce the next speaker who is uh, Dui Pam and Hyung Lee. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and please mute yourself, uh, Richard. I'll mute you. No, I can't do that. All right. And the talk uh, is called, entitled Keratose uh, Sponge Microbial Carbonate Consortium in the Columnar Stromatolites and Trombolite Mounts from the Lower Ordovician Mongkok Formation, Jeongwo, in Korea. Uh, are you ready? 
Um, I don't think we can hear you. Hello, can you? Yeah. Hear? Yes, now we can. Yep. Okay. Uh, I just share my slide. Did you Did you guys see it? Yes. It's okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Okay. Uh, hello. Hello, you all. Uh, I am Yui Pham. I'm recently graduating master degree in Chungnam National University. And, and uh, to be honest, I just finished a home in isolation from last Sunday after traveling back to my country, which is Vietnam. So I quite, quite happy for me that I have a chance to talk to you. So many people here after a long time being alone. So back to the main point. I today would like to present my research about keratosplan and microbial carbonate consortium in South Korea. Uh, as first, I will give some information about the current research, then mention the geological background of the study area, where the research was conducted with several observation and interpretation. Um, the observation. So, sorry uh -huh. to interrupt you. We still see a white screen right now. Um, okay. I'm sorry, I'm not made familiar with this one, so. No. Okay. Uh, maybe it's when you share screen, you have to. Um, uh, okay. You have to click. Oh, sorry. Uh, can you see it now? Yeah, I, I, try now. To, yeah. Yeah. I just tried to share my, my desktop. Okay. Okay. Can you go into presentation mode by clicking the icon in the in the lower right? Okay. Uh, yeah, sorry. This is the first time I do the Zoom conference, so maybe it's uh, quite new for me. Okay. So yep, everyone that works. Yep. Perfect. Perfect. Yep. That's perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I will come back. Uh, yeah. I back to the, my contents. I will give some information about the, my research. Mention about geological background, where research was conducted with several observation and interpretation. The observation and interpretation will be reviewed in the results section. And later, I draw out some of the discussed points, what we can infer from this study. And finally, I conclude some of the main idea and how research will help us on a better understanding on paleorip ecosystem. Uh, before the main story, it's imp it important to ask a very first question. What is Keratos? Uh, they are described very early by Michin in 1900, and they are subclass of them on Pongia. These types of spun lack of spicule, but consist of spongin fiber, or some, sometimes you can refer as an organic skeleton. The organic skeleton uh, showing is this figure, uh, considered to be reserved both in a modern sample as well as an ancient fossil. Their reef forming abilities are confirmed by many biomes found in the rock record globally. The study area located in the Yongwon city in South Korea and distributed with the Yongwon Geological Group, where our study interests belong to. Uh, the Wunga formation is about 200 meters thick, contains mainly carbonate with a little amount of specific plastic. By all the authors, the, form the formation is interpreted to form in subtitle to subtitle environment or within the carbonate platform. In details, the formation were Aside to early of the vision age by several biozones and divided to four members. The outcrop correlates to the middle part of the third member, the Jongman member. And in the de detailed sedimentary here, uh, we show trail metal thick lock that cover the thromboline and thromatoline, which highlight by the red rectangular. The outcrop show that thromatoline recognized by column life above the oolithic grandstone and explosively overland by bioclastic uh, grandstone above. In these cells, the build, builds up a colonel in shape up to 10 centimeters wide and high. The column consists of upward laminae and the intercolumn sediment space built up with bioclastic backstone. In the other hand, the thrombolites were mount in shape and stratigraphically occur not so far below the columnar stromatolite. These mounds are up to 100 centimeter high, 40, 60 centimeter wide dome embedded within the ribbon rock contain lamp shell antenation. Using weathering, we could not observe the metal scale fabric or any internal structure. 
these two types of biotone are considered as chromatolite and thrombolite accordingly, without any further information about their detailed component. We sampled several specimen and repair slab uh, to observe the mesoscale fabric. We also make a thin section directly from this lab to observe the detailed component. In this lab, you can see observed two types of column. This, this uh, slab is from the traumatolite, to be exact. You can see a softer column on the left and the higher column on the right. The column itself consists of lighter color layer, uh, alternating with the dark color layer, and these laminae are generally uneven in thickness. The orange color here indicates dolomatization. Under the microscope, the lighter color filled up with blocky cancer cement and the darker color can be further divided to different components. The first component is keratospin. They are defined by laminar form, which is highlighted with blue color here. That consists of private network embedded in dark microbe. This network in detail consists of irregular thin spherical filament less than 100 micrometers thick and up to a few millimeters long, showing various shape within the meritic matrix between filaments. In some cases, the network show traditional chains from dense Sulu network. They often ray upward to pyloid and then fill up with blocky cancer cement, indicate different spun degradation. The second component comprised of dark color layer is a microbial carbonate. Uh, they are generally characterized by few millimeter, one to two millimeter thick dark micro layer, showing microscopically clotted to clearly laminated structure. This layer comprises very thin, less than around 0 0.5 millimeter thick, undulatory to flat, with partly diffused to darker red microbe. Uh, sometimes you can see partial to complete dolomization commonly occurs along the microbial carbon layer, and they often diffuse to dark gray organic moderate microclots. Combining all, uh, all of these observations, we can imply that the column is formed by alternation of spun and microbial layer. For the thrombolite, uh, the slab analysis indicates that these thrombolite consists of several thrombolytic clots with micri and various class. Uh, combining with uh, the details uh, thin section observation, we further recognize two types of plot, highlight with uh, right color and red color here. The first type of plot uh, we call is keratos microbial clots, and they are barely marked by the white dash light. They, these clots are around five centimeter bold length and wide. And normally they showing global to purple in shape and mainly consists of this few network of keratospin and microbial carbonate patches. The other plot highlighted by red color, we call it lithistic microstromatolite, are rel relatively smaller in size than the keratos uh, microbial clot, and usually up to one centimeter in both wide and height. The lithistic spun microstromatolite often form in encrusting relationship within the class. And in some case, the margins of the class are nearly vertical, clearly separating the class from the interclass. And the interclass is filled with micri and very intraclass. The characters spun in the thromboli is consists similar aerogate network found in traumatoli column. They also defy by an adenosine network with filament embedded with a meritic matrix. The only difference we can notice is that rather than laminoid four, they form a cent centimeter scale global or to purple shape. In some cases, patched to massive uh, geometry can be found in the network, in the case of the spun degradation. The second main component of thrombolite is micro microbial carbonate, which is highlighted by the, the red color here. They occur as a dark gray meritic patches and intermingle with keratosan network. Columnar microstromatolite in other types of microbial carbonate that can reach up to uh, tens millimeter high and eight millimeter, millimeter wide. They often lateral link column, as you can see here, forming flat to wavy structure of a thickly stacked branch column. They consist of the lighter ray microsparitic and dark gray micritic laminate. In the micro photograph on the lower left showing the stacked branch column built on the, directly on the lithic spun 
and in turn they encroach the by another lattice system. If you can uh, take a some further notice, we can observe another uh, microstromatolite form of both the whole flux of the lattice system. This example indicates that these two components mutually encroaching one another to form lattice microstromatolite flux. Uh, in this slide, we, I will reveal the history of the Keratosan microbial associations in uh, early Cambrian to early Octavision. Uh, keratosperm and microbial carbonate association are recently recognized as types of biohem that occur throughout the Paleozoic, especially early Paleozoic. They could participate in the reef ecosystem as various roles from reef builder, contributor, or scriptic member. The, uh, one of the earliest known occurrences of reef for keratosperm is from mid Cambrian succession from Sino Korea block as a minor cryptic member within the lithistic microbial reef. Uh, recently, in 2015, Luer, Luer actually suggested that their record could be from the early Cambrian of Siberia within Akiosayat microbial reef. Increasing reports of uh, characters occurrences in sino Korea block and South China are recognized within the lithistic reef. Uh, for the reef building role, characters are thought to be able to form reefs in Lake Cambrian. Uh, with, the, uh, with several reports in China and Korea, forming maze-like stromatolytic column by interval with microbes. It's also report in North America and Malaysia. Uh, this study, located in Yongwon, South Korea, they, they distributed in, in sometimes approximately around late Tremendosian. Uh, so that, that indicate that these reef pattern of the keratosperm association can be found throughout the world during this period. So we also do some review, some reef data related to spun reef. Uh, this table summarizes all the significant uh, consortium reef from late Cambrian to early of the vision. The red color here showing uh, the reef where keratos play as a reef building role. We notice that among these reef, there are several traumatolites build up, including the Mongol formation, which is located here. These traumatolites are formed within the high energy environment, which allow deposition of the backstone to rainstone. The Mongol thrombolite and other examples, such as material reef, are reported in China, located where interframe microbes occur suggesting that they form in a lower energy environment than the one from stromatolite. Furthermore, in these kinds of keratos reef, there's no unlimited portion of lithic spawn occurrences. This also true applied to my example, where stromatolite devoid of lithic in their column, and the lithic micro stromatolite occur limitedly in thrombolite. And the white, the blue color here, showing the significant lithic reef during this time, Interestingly, these lysis reef form in the environment that allow allo microbes to settle out, which means they mean they form under the lower energy condition than those in stromatolite reef. Additionally, in this set of reef, we notice that keratos being as a minor cryptic member, or uh, some of them non-evident of keratos occurrences are reported. This truly applies for the rest. So we suggest that there may be the inverse correlation between the rebuilding keratosan and lithitis root. This can be caused by competition by uh, such as uh, on resource on food, space, or even hydrodynamic. Uh, writing in 2002, uh, proposed the hydrodynamic that could affect the reef configuration. Follow our observation on the Lake Cambrian early observation spawn association reef, we proposed the diagram in the lower part Whereas the higher, higher hydrodynamic condition reef form tight laminate frame reef and domical open frame reef develop in the intermediate energy environment. In the low energy environment on the left side, cluster reef are thought to be dominantly occurs. We imply that the Mongol stromatolite similar with the tight laminate frame reef, whereas the thrombolite fits better with the cluster reef type. The lithistic reef are better Categorize within domical frame reef where energy condition is low enough for interframe microbial deposits. So similarly, there are several points to consider from the study. First, the stromatolite are consisting of laminoidal keratosperm with microbiolite, 
influencing one another to form stromatolytic laminae. On the other hand, the globular to bubbush keratostan microbial association view thrombolite plus with limited lithistic microbial association. Second, these biome are superficially similar to microbiolite, this suggesting that they could have been undiscovered similarly globally. Additionally, the keratos as important reform member during Paleozoic, contributor at a rebuilder, contributor or cryptic member. Third, uh, this study also suggests that there are different environmental adaptation between keratos and lithosis group, as I mentioned earlier. And last but not least, uh, the Mongo biohem as a new example to keratospin microbial carbon reef to our database. So this undoubtedly will help us to reconstruct the reef evolution during Gompi. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. If you have any question, please feel free to ask and give my comment also. Yep. Any questions for Louis? Oh, I have a question. May yes. Could you hear me? Yes. But my camera does, didn't work a couple of minutes ago. Sorry. Um, my question is that, like the, the quartos uh, versus the lysistate sponges, how about the situation of the middle to late artificial period? They're competing or they're just uh, adapted to different environments? So you've mentioned that they are like uh, um, adapt adapted to different environments during the Cambrian to early artificial. But how about the situation okay. in middle from middle to late artificial? Thank you. Uh, I'm I'm sorry, I'm not hearing your question well. But as I understand, uh, you mentioned that about how about the the middle to late artificial periods? Is it correct? Yes. Yes. Exactly. Uh, so the, the scope of my research is uh, focused on uh, keratospin and following the evolution of the keratospin, we, we, we do see that the trending after the middle to late of the vision, they are very scary report globally rather than that we see all the rising up of uh, bryozoan rib builder. So, so basically back to my point that which all the example I collect and I review from Cambrian to Octavision, I see the trending that in those kind of uh, in those kind of environment where the where they form in a shallowing where the high energy condition occurs, they they rather try to form the tight laminate uh, laminate structure to uh, to overcome the, the the high condition, whereas in the lower energy condition, they try, they they have ability to expand their body to various uh, direction. So so when we comparing the, let me show you something. So when you comparing the the keratospin in the lower uh, energy condition, they you can see that they not form the laminoidal form. They expand in every direction. But we if we look at a stromatolite they just limited in uh, to, to expand their horizontal scale rather than vertical scale. So in that case, we see some different mo mode of adaptation to the, to the environmental setting. By that, by, by combining all the data with previous uh, periods, we, we, we propose the diagram that maybe there could be some uh, different adaptation to different uh, environment setting of keratospin. And also one thing we, we infer in imply from, from this research that we rarely see keratos and lithis group, uh, they can uh, coexist to one another. They rather than have inverse correlation to one, uh, one, uh, one another. So, so that the main, so that the, some, some of the main point that we uh, imply from, from this uh, research. And for the for the middle to lay Cambria, uh, more for the lay middle to uh, lay uh, of the vision, we we don't see that much example to to make a comparison so far. And and based on the history of the the reforming uh, evolution, uh, they the later part of the of the vision were uh, were don't 
dominant by all the bryozoal reef building organism than keratos and lithic. Uh, hopefully that answer your question. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, we have, there's one more question, but I think we'll take it during the uh, breakout groups uh, from Stephen Kershaw, but you can also see it in the chat. Um, so let's move on to the next speaker to stay on time, and that's Du Feng Chen, uh, Fritz Neuweiler, and Li Chang. Uh, can you unshare the screen? Um, uh, yes. Uh, thank you. Okay. I don't know how to uh, stop sharing. Okay, I got it. Thank uh, you. Thank you very it. much. All right. And the title for the next talk is Autovision Diversification of Calcium Microbes and Calcareous Algae. So, hello everyone, can you see the, the screen? No, we cannot. Oh. Cannot? No. Nope. I, okay. I see. Yeah, that helps. Yes, okay. now we can. Yes, that works. Okay, great. So thank you so much, Thais. And then the map presentation, we'll get back into the artificial green world. And here's the catch microbes and the Kekrix LG. And this is actually an extension of our work published before. And as we know, both catch microbes and the Kekrix LG form part of the epimbenthic primary production, like the sun bacteria, green and the red LG and thereby represent a fundamental traffic element of the uh, remaining paleoecology characterizing the artificial biodiversification uh, period. However, regarding the great artificial biodiversification events, people often emphasize that, okay, the Gobi represents a transition from the Cambrian evolutionary fauna towards to the Paleozoic evolutionary fauna. While the art of vision flora was paid less attention to and even ignored. And uh, furthermore, when we look at these uh, diversity curves of the art of vision organisms, we could see only just like a compiled diversity curves for marine, phyto, and zooplankton in combination with diversity curves of a number of marine invertebrates. But for the primary producers, like the cast microbes and the characteristic algae, as well as the non classified algae uh, were not even mentioned. And uh, fortunately, uh, the good preservation of artificial cast microbes in the Kikris algae in the Western Torin Basin, Northwest of China, allows us to establish the original diversity curve at a spacious level and to explore the uh, potential climatic or environmental response behind their diversification. Then paleogeographically, the Western Torrin Basin is an example of a tropical, shallow water, carbonate rain depositional environment of the Proto-Turtis Ocean. Well, the study area is the Leia'ili Taga Ridge, uh, located near the northwestern limit of the so-called Bachu uplift of the Northwestern Torrin Basin. And uh, it exposes the middle to up elevation boundary interval, which contains um, three formations spanning from the Periodon Flabellum to the Bellavina Conference Zone. And from the base to the top, we can see that this strata are outcropped, uh, composed of uh, in, an intercalation of uh, calcious punchments and uh, biplastic limestones with uh, for the EGMA formation within uh, uh, the radiant age and the red age uh, adolescent limestones of the uh, tumultuous formation with the salmon age and then the massive greedy nodular to badular limestones of the nanotech formation and with the canteen age. The entire sec uh, section uh, covers an approximate time span of 20 million years, namely from 417 to 400, 450 million years. Then we found this uh, cast microbes and calcareous algae. And we found that a total number of 24 taxa of cast microbes and calcareous algae were preserved in the study area. 
and the most of them are resolved at a spacious level. Herein, we can see 14 taxa of cast microbes, include this uh, seven taxa of classified sun bacteria, uh, two species of Gibbonella, the Subtifloria, this one is the Gaudia, and this one is uh, uh, Artinella, Huja, Artinella, and Hestemia. Also, there are uh, seven taxa of cast microbes of uncertain origin, like two species of, of uh, Losplatella, one Phospholophyton, one Renalysis, uh, Weatheredella, Nuya, and uh, Rosalina. While the Caracas algae have a total number of 10 taxa, encompasses seven taxa of uh, Descladacian algae, here the Paleopolola, the Monilipolola, four species of uh, Verminipolola, and the one Arthropolola. There's also one taxon of a Burios dalian alga. This is the highest, and the two cyclopronalian algae, the Mastopora and the Epidem. So the tafonconosis of the cast microbes and cacreous algae are stratigraphically uh, representative of a suite of carbon months, including the classic sponge months, the uh, cast microbe months, the echo months and the reefs, and uh, this is the cast microbe um, months. While the stratigraphic distribution of the cast microbes and cacreous algae is plotted with the resolution at the MEM scale. So then we try to uh, generalize the regional diversity curve for the Western Terrain Basin. And we counted the total number of species recorded within each two million years time interval. We found that the regional diversity curve display fairly low numbers until the lowmost part of the Liangli Taco Formation. Um, within the Belladina Confluence Zone, the diversity increases substantially from around five to more than 20 taxa per two million years. And within the Kantian Liangli Taco Formation, neocast microbes appear in combination with a cacreous algae and their respective diversification into members of desicladalians and the cyclocladalians. That's the so-called artificial flora. We also plotted the total number of cash microbes and cacreous algae reported from the terrain basin, both from outcrops and the, the subsurfaces. And we can see that uh, the numbers of cash microbes and cacreous algae increased from around seven tex 17 taxa into uh, in the Ijefan formation via the Tumshok formation, uh, reached to 50, 54 taxa in the Liangli Taco formation. Then we also plotted the global diversity curve of the cast microbes and the cacreous algae based on uh, mostly uh, Nataki 2004, but at a, at a generous level, and uh, we can see that the global diversity curve are distinct from the original diversity curve. Well, on the global scale, the increase in diversity started earlier, namely within the later Darwellian, Picadusera zone, and the peak is reached within the Sambian Albatus zone. Because of the disconformity here, you can see that uh, for the Bergina Conference zone, beginning of the diversification cannot be de determined for the terrain basin. Nevertheless, taking as the references in the inflection points, we can see that uh, both for the regional and the, the global diversity curve, there is a temporal offset of 4 million years. But why there is an offset, we're still not sure. It might be due to the peculiar histology of the Sambian Tumshuk formation because it represents a condensed section of red red uh, limestones bounded by disconformities. However, a similar temporal offset is recorded for the classic sponge mines. So we don't know. Probably the term tectonic macro plates might display an endemic anachronistic character. Then the global diversity curves of the artificial benthic primary producers are similar to those recorded by some uh, 
herbivores and suspension feeding fossil groups, such as the Eriothrosomon echinoderms, the bivalves, and, and some gastropods. So then we go get back to our term basin. Is there any climatic or environmental response to the diversification of chyst microbes and cucurbit algae in this region? <laughs> it's some uh, stable as top analysis, and we have made a series of sampling from various carbonate components, including different kinds of skeletal components like the luminescent or non-luminescent brachiopods shells and the non-luminescent trilobite fish uh, and epidermic skeletons, the vanilla, and the crinoid fragments, even. Also, with some different kinds of cements and the replacive carbonate minerals. The non skeletal particles with the, the ultramacrods and the alumacrods are all taken uh, account into the sampling and the backrods. Then we plotted all the stable carbon oxygen atopic data from these atopic uh, these samples as well as the data from some literatures. And however, I found that even in one single sample, like here, you can see that the carbon and oxygen stable top data are randomly scattered. So what could be the best rep representative astropic signals of the equivalent marine seawater? To solve this question, we need to distinguish least altered samples from diagenetically altered samples. So a diagenetic filtering and screening is necessary. Thus, the parigenetic sequences here, the petrogenetic programs were established for each formation along the elevation comet succession of the study area. Then here we take the Lally Tucker formation for an, an example. Actually, what we have seen just uh, the, in the rock samples or even in the thin sections are just on the bottom line. But uh, we need to recover them to see the original uh, components, which are representative of the, uh, of the original marine geochemical data. So finally, carbon and uh, oxygen stable isotopic uh, composition from least altered samples of uh, low mechanism calcite skeletons, such as the non luminescent. Uh, rocky part shells, as well as early cements, both show an increasing trend from the Darwinian to early Kentian. And then respectively, up to 2.5 per mil for carbon as top values. Here, probably we can find the GICE within the term basin. And up to 2 per mil for oxygen as top values. And from the curve, we found that the peaks of the carbon and the oxygen uh, stable astorbs are contemporaneously with the peak of the diversification of cast microbes and calculus algae. So it is just by accident or there is a climatic or environmental response. So probably there is a combination of carbon stable isotope excursion due to the burial of organic matter and the formation of source rocks here, the Tumushoku formation, and the, its equivalent, the Kaling formation, and the below sarga black shield, the Kelvin region, 50 kilometers northwest, represents a condensed section with an environmental joining. And in association with the cooling trend induced the by sedimentary turnover from benthic active and the passive field feeders via the hemiplegic consortium to the benthic perm producers, as well as the biodiversification of uh, other organisms like the corals and the stomatoids through the middle to late elevation of the northwestern perm basin. So, what is next? Is there any connections in between the artificial green mantle and the artificial climatic cooling and oxygenation? So, the work is should be done for these like uh, non classified algae and the uh, cash microbes and cacus algae from other regions. Also, the terrestrial invasion of the land plants and the phytoplankton. How about their diversification and the relationship in between? the climatic cooling and the oxygenation. So in a short summary, 
and can see a total of 24 taxa of past microbes and cacreous algae are identified from the Dakinjian to low Kenjian succession exposed at the Yai type reach term basin. And uh, the regional diversity curve stay at low numbers until the Sapien of production reduced or reduced zone. And uh, diversity increased substantially from around five to more than 20 taxa per million in the uh, lower Kenjian Belodina conference zone. And this diversification essentially is due to neocast microbes and the diversification of Desicadacian and uh, the cyclochronalins. While the global diversity curve is distinct from the term basin, on the global scale, diversification started earlier, namely within the later Darwinian Pseudocerathum. And there's an observed temporal offset of about 4 million might be due to the periodicity of the Sandian tomological formation. However, a similar temporal offset is recorded for the classic spawn months. The, the peaks of stable, stable carbon oxygen asteroids are contemporaneous with the peak of diversification of cash microbes and aqueous algae within the term basin. Finally, there might be a combination of carbon stable asteroid excursion due to the barrier of organic carbon and the formation of sulfurites and the cooling trend induced the by sediment return over via yeah, an environmental drilling presented through the middle to late elevation of the term basin. So that's my presentation. Thank you so much. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any questions? Okay, may I ask some question? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, as you know that the, uh, we have many different kind of calcium microbes in the terrain basin for the upper division, but uh, I'm not really sure whether there are any studies that can be comparable to that of Tarim in the other places of the world. Do you know of any? And can you really see this kind of high diversity of calcium microbes in the other places of the world? Yes, actually, we have like a, a collection of data from North America, especially in Quebec. And but the age of this diversification is totally different from the materials in the Tarim basin. And they are much earlier. The, 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 the kind of microbes and the characters energy were diversified much earlier than those in the Torim basin. Yep, so the reason that I'm asking you this question is that this diversification of the calcium microbes are quite much related with the paleoceanographic changes rather than the real diversification of the microbes. So what I, the question is how, uh, if there's any regional difference in the diversification of the calcium microbes, then how can we integrate it? Are they really integrated as the real diversification of the microbial organisms or rather than the changes in the seawater chemistry or temperatures or anything else? Yes, this, this, it's a very good question actually. And um, from the current basin, actually for the Tumushok formation, they have two dis disconformities in between the Lyanitak formation, the Kantian and the Darwinian. So we don't know, probably there's something missing or something just like the, 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 the beers uh, that made the diversification of the cast microbes and the chemical energy in the term basin much later, probably this reason. Because there are still kind of disconformities in between. So we don't know the, uh, the specific age of the diversification. All right, thank you for the answer. Uh, we will move on to the last speaker um, of today. And that is uh, Sikitas Ratsevicius. Hope I pronounced that right. Hitchlau Trela, Andrius Gabaras, Doratas Kutma, and Marius Utumekas. And they are presenting on integrated bio and chemostratigraphy of the upper Homerian Sidorian from the Kilech Zatznov Peak 1 well in the Holy Cross Mountains in Poland. I hope that was clear. Uh, not bad. Okay, Sigitas. Uno momento. Yes, we do see your slides, so 
Uh, hello, dear colleagues, speakers. So I would like to represent some preliminary data of, of our project. It's some hemo biostratigraphy from Holy Cross Mountains, Silurian, quite far away from quite younger than our division. But anyway, maybe you found something interesting. So, in a moment. So when everybody knows who investigated Silurian uh, period uh, in Wenlock uh, epoch exists uh, exists um, two main uh, events. Irevikan is, is uh, linking to uh, Ricardonensis bioson, and second one is uh, Mulde event is linking Parvos uh, Ludensis bioson. Uh, so this material come from Holy Cross Mountains, something here, if you will see it's in central Poland, uh, in the west side of, of this return with the zone. The tonic is huge. It's starting, I think, from Christian House until uh, Black Sea. Uh, so the Holy Cross Mountains is subdivided in two regions. It's in the south part exists uh, uh, Lisaguri region. In sorry, in north part Lisaguri region. In south part exists uh, Kelsey unit. So uh, the Plesian of Velkore is uh, exactly here in Kelsey region. Uh, the difference between these uh, regions. Uh, how to say it, not, not, not my problem, it's more the Polish colleagues, uh, they're discussing quite a long time. Uh, one belong to Malopolska block, our one to Lisagura block. One belong or was something near Peribaltic stuff. Our one to, I don't know, Perigonvana, sometimes our authors say it, uh, it's Peribaltic as well. So the samples was collecting each meter uh, and for graptolites and then and, and for carbon isotopes uh, investigation. And uh, the geological section is composed by uh, shales. So uh, there is no carbonatic stuff. So this uh, stuff was uh, uh, for carbonates was investigated from organic material. So this uh, was dissolved using by acid and after that we make measuring. And in this interval we have some bentonites or volcanic ashes layers, layers, sorry, and, and it's quite important for future investigation. So geostratigraphy. Uh, the lower part we have this Lungreni bioson with uh, uh, assemblage of graptolites, like Certograptus Lungreni tests and so on. That was important. We found Monograptus ambigus. It's quite this picture. It's quite interesting stuff because ambigus uh, exists as we know just from uh, Bohemia and Saxo Thuringia, Thuringia in, in, in uh, Europe. So NASA and Parvus Bison, we, we didn't split NASA because it's our interesting stuff. We didn't found related in general. Mm, it's uh, quite strange because very big abundance of uh, how to say, renewal this uh, group of graptolites. So, Pradeubele bison with typical stuff, uh, Deubele, Ludensis with Gerhard, and of course, uh, Nas. So, uh, carbon isotopes is typical curve of, of or excursion of carbon, organic carbon isotopes is typical, it's like around the world. Some fast peak is in 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 in, 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 in on the boundary on Parvus Lundgreni bioson. Second one positive stuff exists in in Dobeli bioson, uh, and 
nothing matter and, and uh, how to say the unlock and the mood of boundary. So it's just fast data and so on. So conclusions. In general, we don't have conclusions because it's just first step. But uh, we must have some uh, geological section of multi integral is quite complete, stratigraphical complete. It means we have all successions from Lungrini, uh, Parvus, Nasa, Diobeli, Pradiobeli, and Ludensis Bison. So better to say future plants. Uh, why you don't have retroalities? Ambiguous, for example. Mm, uh, these species are known from Bohemia, from Saxo Thuringia, from Germany, but uh, it's documented first time from Holy Cross Mountains. And our steps will be uh, geochemistry of volcanic ashes, then maybe uh, biomarkers. So this is my short talk. Thank you for your attention. Maybe somebody have questions. All right, we have plenty of time for questions. Do we have anyone? I've got one. Um, I, I did some field work in Wales and this sort of interval. And what I found was you had occasional beds with very high abundance of etiolitis, particularly got the Graptus nasa, but then none in the rest of the beds. So I'm wondering if there's a similar pattern in this core that you have to be lucky and hit it at the right level to get the retiolitis. Yeah, I don't know why. Maybe in well storage, rabbits recollect with retiolitis. It's really very strange because it's very abundant with retiolitis. And this interval, uh, what you're talking in Welsh, uh, for example, is a standard of boundary uh, Wenlock and Woodlock. So it must be quite a lot, uh, this kind of, of uh, graptolites. But in deep faces, in this part, for example, if we will go Uno momento. Yeah, exists here yeah, uh, Bardo outcrop. It's traditional, it's uh, outcrop quite well known, more than 100 years. It's a standard in Poland uh, of, of uh, in, in Poland of, of uh, upper part of Wenlock. Uh, deer of his retiolitids, but here, yeah, in this well core, we didn't found. So maybe rabbits eat it, or maybe somebody recollect, but it's not possibility because it's uh, well core is five inch. So you split it anyway, you must found something, but just monographies, no retalities. All right. Any other questions? If not, Christian, do you think we should move out in um, groups or breakout groups, or how would you prefer? Yeah, I was thinking so this was the um the last talk of the day, so we could just do like yesterday and then people can stick around if they want to. Uh, I will stop the recording now. Uh, this time I will stop the recording. <laughs> uh, but then I'll create these uh, random rooms and then we can chat for as long as, uh, as you like. But uh, otherwise, see you tomorrow uh, at some time. I can't remember when it starts. <laughs> yeah, tomorrow it will be uh, um, 2 p.m. It starts uh, UTC time, so depending on where you are, it will be much later than today. Yeah. Okay, see you tomorrow. Yep.
Please, Laura.